Psalm 65. Psalm 65 says this, Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who steals the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. And then here's our prayer for 2024. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks, and the valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for this time. God, I thank you for your word. Uh, God, I thank you that Sunday after Sunday, week after week, you are faithful uh, to crown this time with your bounty and your goodness and your favor. And God, we ask for nothing less this morning. God, I ask that you, by the power of your spirit, would meet us here. God, would you descend mightily upon this next hour. God, show us the beauty and the worthiness of your Son, Jesus. God, would you enlarge our hearts, open our eyes, help us to see him for all that he is worth and love him rightly. God, would you meet us here? Lord, I don't know what uh, the past year has held for the people in this room. Uh, I don't know the highs and the lows and uh, the trials and the hard days, but Lord, you know them all. God, I pray this morning we would remember uh, that even when it was dark and hard to see, God, you have faithfully uh, walked in front and behind and by our side uh, through every valley of 2023. Uh, and God, I pray that you would help us to remember that in this next year we can expect no less. God, you're good, you are faithful, and you are worthy. Uh, and I pray that we would worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Uh, in all this, Lord, I ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good. Y'all stayed up. I was about to say no. Don't sit down All right. Well, let's go ahead and welcome everybody this morning and um, take a minute and just turn and handshake and wave and hug from a distance or whatever you want to do before we get started this morning. charged up today? Yeah, yeah, we should be good. I was telling Amanda that. Or was I telling you? That I ordered a mic to record. It must have been Amanda. Ordered a mic to record. Alright guys, we're going to start singing this morning. That way, if this ever dies, I'll have to record. If you want to use your hymnal, as always, The materials I've been asking for from the past week. We're going to sing the first and last verses. Tell the good news. <laughs> Thank you. 
with us our prayer going into 2024 and if hopefully he's the king of our heart and um you just pray for us to maybe get even closer and, and let him be more in control of our hearts amen <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We would like to turn to the Bible, so I'm going to be reading Psalm 131. And it says, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things that are too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, Put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <coughs> Amen. All right, you can have a seat for me. Thank you, Ms. Sheila. Thank you, Corey. Like Ms. Sheila read, we will be in Psalm uh, 131 this morning. Uh, I was telling... Uh, our group this morning that it was over a year ago uh, in October I came and preached through this psalm just filling in uh, so some of you may have heard some of this uh, a good good amount of you were not here for that and so this will all be new um, but in the same in a similar fashion that I told you uh, when we started our Advent series that each and every year uh, regardless of where the Lord leads and what uh, Series or books of the Bible we go through every single year, the four weeks leading up to Christmas. Uh, my preaching calendar is filled. It's already planned, and we're going to talk through Advent in some sense or fashion. Uh, the same is true for this Sunday, uh, before between Advent and before we launch into the new year. Uh, we will always, as long as I'm here and you know able, uh, we will preach this Sunday through Psalm 131. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. And the number one being this. Um, because I need this. Uh, I, I think you'll see as we get into this song that it is worthy to be pursued, uh, to live like this, to be described in the way, uh, to, for Psalm 131 to be modeled in our life. I need this. When we enter into a new year, I want Psalm 131 to be the banner over me stepping into 2024. I want it to be in my bones. Uh, so I'm going to preach through Psalm 131 on the last Sunday of every year to remind myself of what awaits in the new year. Uh, the second, more simply, being because it's my favorite. Uh, and sometimes you just want to preach what is your favorite. It's my favorite song, possibly my favorite uh, portion uh, of Scripture. And then number three, and this is really only true of this year, uh, but Psalm 131 sets us up well for uh, our new series that we will start next week in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. If there's any psalm that I would say, any passage of scripture that models, takes the entire book of Ecclesiastes, uh, shrinks it down into a few verses, and says, here's the main idea. I think it would be uh, Psalm 131. And a quick announcement on that. I've sent this uh, in our Facebook prayer group. Uh, but this is what's called an ESV Scripture Journal. Uh, this is on the book of Ecclesiastes. They sell these for about $5.99. If you want one like this with the fancy drawings all throughout the pages, then you can get this one. Or you can get just the black one. Uh, and the cool thing about this is it has, on every page, Scripture on one side, empty on the other. Uh, so me and Kelly love these. There's plenty of room to take notes. Uh, and I would just encourage you, we're going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes uh, for the next few years, maybe. So if you if you want to get one of these and take, and take notes through it, uh, that is a great thing for you to do. You can get them on Amazon, Christian Book, Crossway, uh, wherever books are sold, as they say. You can get one of those. Uh, but this psalm sets us up well for the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and, and I love this psalm, and I think it draws me in, uh, but simply because it describes so much uh, of what I want to be. Uh, it it paints, a, paints a picture of the life with God that I want so badly. Or to put it another way, uh, when I grow up, I want to be like Psalm 131. Uh, Spurgeon said this about this psalm. He said, Psalm 131 is one of the shortest psalms to read, but the longest to learn. Uh, and I, I think you'll notice that to be true as we go through this, that the people who model this, uh, very few of them don't have fully gray hair uh, or no hair. 
uh, I think it takes a lot of years and a lot of learning and a lot of shaping and molding uh, for this psalm to be true of us. Uh, but to sum it up, to, sum it up uh, to sum up this psalm in one sentence, uh, I'd explain it like this. Psalm 131 is about a kind of contentment. Uh, and already we're like, oh my gosh, that is not me. <laughs> Psalm 131 is about a kind of contentment or stillness or quietness of soul that is not rooted in circumstances, but in God. Amen. A God who never changes in his utter commitment to us in Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, so in short, Psalm 131 teaches us composure. Uh, it teaches us how to be content in God, in the lot that we have been given, as Ecclesiastes will show us. Uh, one pastor says this. He says it's a show and tell about how to be peaceful inside. I love that language. Uh, and I don't know about you, but if I'm making a New Year's resolution, uh, which I never have because by February I'm just covered in shame. If I'm making a New Year's resolution, uh, that trumps them all. Peaceful, inside, content, composed. If there's anything I want to be marked by in 2024, it's those things. That the Lord has done that in me. Uh, but there's a lot of work to do in these three short verses. Uh, so let me read it again and then we will get started. It says this. Uh, Terry Moore asked me what psalm we'd be in, and I said, Psalm 131, and he was trying to find it. And I said, honestly, Terry, it's so short, you could probably uh, memorize it before I even get up there. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, what is it? I said, I don't know, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> but Psalm 131 says this, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, O oh Liberty Baptist Church, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Uh, God, I pray that the meditation of all of our hearts, Lord, and the words of my mouth would be uh, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Uh, oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. God, make your book and your word come alive to us this morning and make us alive through it. Uh, God, we love you. We love Jesus. Help us to love him more uh, and grow the truth of Psalm 131. Uh, grow that deep into us. Uh, let, this, let this psalm describe us in the new year. Uh, it's in your son's beautiful and holy, holy, holy name I pray. Everybody say Amen. 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 So Psalm 131, what we're listening into on this psalm is uh, most simply the inner life of King David. David has learned, at this point in his life anyway, uh, what it means to be content. Again, he's learned composure. Uh, imperfectly, but he's learned composure. Uh, and what I want to do is walk through these three verses uh, to see the path that David took to learn these lessons. And then we will end up with the invitation that he extends to you and to me. Point number one, uh, if you're a note taker, is this. David renounces pride. He renounces pride. Verse one says this. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. David pins this psalm in the midst of, uh, there's no other word for it, accusation. Now, in the midst of assaults on his character and his motivation, uh, David has been accused at this point in his life of prideful ambition, of chasing uh, the throne for all the power and all the prestige and all the glory and all the stuff that comes with being the king. Uh, Saul and all of Saul's minions and his men have uh, labeled David as one who thirsted for power. Uh, and yet, as we listen in on David's words in this psalm, uh, as we hear his heart, you have to wonder and ask. Uh, it seems as if David longs for the exact opposite of those things. Uh, you have to wonder if David longs for the simplicity that he once knew as a shepherd, as a nobody. Mm -hmm. But yet, to look at the story of David, to look at his meteoric rise, uh, it makes sense that people would accuse him of being motivated by pride. 
Now, if ever there was a man who did great and marvelous things, it was David. Right. Uh, he slayed Goliath. He killed bears and lions with his, with his bare hands. No pun intended. He conquered Jerusalem. Uh, he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. David was a military and political genius. Yeah. Uh, we read that Saul killed his thousands, but David slayed his tens of thousands. Uh, David was also a gifted musician and a poet. Uh, he united the northern and the southern kingdoms. He was the covenant forerunner to Christ. Uh, he secured a promise of a kingdom that would never end, beginning with his kingship. Again, David did great and marvelous things by every stretch of the imagination. Yes. And yet he writes here that he does not occupy himself. Or another way to say that he does not concern himself with things too great right. and too marvelous for him. Uh, and here's what I think you and I can learn uh, from the mindset of David. We live in a culture of a culture of doing. Uh, especially people around my age. The question that haunts uh, my generation is uh, and what every big name pastor has written a book about at some point is what is God's will for my life? Uh, that's the question we all want to know. What does he want me to do? Who should I marry? Where should I live? What job should I take? What does God want me to do? Uh, and I would say that the Lord definitely cares about what we do. He cares about all those things. Yes and amen. Yeah. Uh, but I would argue that the Bible is far less concerned about doing uh, and far more concerned about being. And what I mean by that is I think often we ask the wrong questions of God. Instead of asking, what would God have me to do? We should be asking, what kind of person uh, would God have me to be? Uh, and this is one of the lessons that we're learning from David, that his position uh, and his prestige and, and all these things, it wasn't all that important to David. Uh, he was just as self-secure uh, and content with his lot uh, when he was tending sheep as he was when he was uh, sitting on the throne. Uh, it didn't matter if David was a nobody shepherd or a high and mighty king. What mattered was his heart posture before the Lord. Right. What David models for us here is a deep uh, and mature level of God honoring humility and God honoring submission to the sovereignty and the care of God. Yeah. And again, the first step to this is always renouncing and turning away uh, from our pride. I love what C.S. Lewis has to say about pride. He says this. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, uh, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. The essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Yeah. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. Yes. It is the complete, and this is so good, it is the complete anti-God state of mind. Yeah. Amen. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. Uh, the argument that Lewis is making here is that the Bible doesn't seem to talk about uh, pride as merely another sin on a long list of sins. Yeah. Now, pride seems to be the first sin and the root sin from which all other sins flow. And I think we see this most clearly in the garden. The fall of Genesis 3 did not happen uh, because Adam and Eve were hungry. It did not happen because they desired fruit and that was the only tree in the garden. They had plenty to eat. Uh, sin entered God's world uh, on a road paved with pride and paved with desire. Yeah. Uh, and their desire was to be limitless. Uh, the desire for autonomy, the desire to be like God. Sin entering into this world and fracturing everything uh, was the result of a proud self-will. Uh, and that's the funny thing about pride is it's so easy to spot in others. Mm -hmm. And yet, because of our pride, it's so hard to spot in ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and the, <laughs> but that Genesis 3 desire uh, is still alive and well in all of us. Uh, I love... I mention almost every Sunday some example from the West Wing, but 
Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin, when he is writing these episodes, he has made it clear that the West Wing does not portray real life. It portrays the best possible outcome of politics. In, in the perfect world, this is what politics would look like. And even in his portrayal of that, the thing that you walk away from is every leader of every nation and every person is 100% motivated by their pride. If their nation is crumbling, they would rather let it crumble and their people suffer than accept help and admit that they needed help. And that's so alive in each of us. Uh, and it often plays itself out in the same old ways in our wanting to be like God. In our occupying ourselves with things too great and too marvelous for us. Uh, so my question for us today is this. And this is going to look different for each of us. But what are those things in your life? What great and marvelous and out of reach things do you habitually set your sights on? Uh, the big things are obvious. Uh, money and power and influence and position and importance. Uh, or the big three, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, that may be your thing. Uh, the American dream, maybe to do well in business, to buy new things, to uh, get all the new toys, to make lots of money, I don't know. Uh, I think some of that is probably alive and well in all of us to some yeah. extent. Yeah. Uh, but I think most of us fall into some other traps. I think what, get, what gets most of us uh, is that our pride leads us to try to do the impossible. Uh, and by impossible... Uh, what I mean is this. We, we desperately seek to control things that we can't control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we occupy ourselves with things too great and too marvelous for us. Kelly was complaining recently about taking care of herself and doing all these things and exercising and eating right and having all these essential oils and all that stuff that I'm sure helps somebody. Um, but, and she said, but I still, you know, get sick, and it still hurts, and I still experience pain, and it's like nothing has helped. And my response, which I'm sure didn't comfort her, was Ecclesiastes. That is life <laughs> under the sun in a broken world. Yeah. That is seeking to control things that you simply <laughs> cannot control. Eat all the kale you want. Death will come find you one day. Yeah. Life is still hard. Life is still broken. Uh, as C.S. Lewis says in A Grief Observed, he says, it doesn't matter if you grip the dentist chair or lay there lifelessly. The drill drills on. And that's truth. That's life under the sun in this right. broken world. We occupy ourselves with things too great and too marvelous for us. Uh, David Powelson, uh, who is a Christian author and counselor, he says this. He says, even the small everyday things that everyone races after are in fact beyond us. Uh, from your daily bread to your abilities and opportunities. These are gifts from God that you do not control. What happens when you attempt to control another person's attitudes and choices? And this is clear that we try to do this, especially in the holidays. What happens when you attempt to control another person's attitude and choices? To bend them to your will. You set yourself up for all sorts of ugly things. Despair or rage. Anxiety or short-lived euphoria. Suspicion or manipulation? What happens when you attempt to ensure that you will not get sick and die? You become obsessed with diet and exercise, or right. suspicious toward doctors, right. or plagued with fear that any nagging pain might be the big one that finally gets you. That's me every night when I lay down. Yeah. Uh, what happens when you are obsessed with getting people to like you? You become flirtatious or artificial, mm -hmm. a coward or a deceiver, mm -hmm. a chameleon or a recluse. Uh, you and I are anxious and we are noisy on the inside because we so often try to play God in our <laughs> lives and play God in the lives of others. Uh, our problem is that our pride has taught us to seek limits uh, or things being beyond our control uh, as a curse and not as a blessing. And that's just not the truth of Scripture. Uh, Adam and Eve were limited before Genesis 3. Limits were around before the fall. To be limited is to be human, and human is exactly uh, who God made us to be. Right. A sure way to be crushed 
by anxiety is to always seek to control things that you have no business trying to control. Yeah. And a sure way to turn from that pride and instead rest in God's control is to open-handedly admit the words of John the Baptist in John chapter 3 when he says, I am not the Christ. Yeah. I am not the Christ. That is a tangible thing that you can repeat to yourself in moments when things happen that are beyond your control. Remind yourself, I am not the Christ. Right. Get a placard for your desk uh, or your window. I am not the Christ. And I want you to hear me say this, uh, because in a room this size, uh, it's guaranteed that uh, some of you may be walking through, or are walking through some very difficult things. Uh, as we enter into 2024, uh, if you remember anything from today, let it be this. The Lord can be trusted with your family. The Lord can be trusted with your job. Right. Uh, the Lord can be trusted with your finances. He can be trusted with your children. He can be trusted with your relationships. Uh, he can be trusted with your future. And the Lord can be trusted with your health. Uh, and yet the angst and the restlessness and the noise in your soul and mind is because deep down, uh, we don't believe that to be true. Uh, or to put it another way, I can believe all of those things to be true for you. But it's often very hard to believe those things to be true for us. Yeah. But here's the first step to finding freedom uh, from that. Uh, it may sound silly, but at some point you just have to trust that God, that God is better at being God than you are. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And that's what David models for us in this song. He renounces pride and he humbly submits to God in all things. Point number two is this. David chooses composure. It says this in verse two. He says, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Notice the language of David here. His soul is calm and quiet because he has made it that way. Now, composure of soul comes only through active Choice Again, as we've said the last few weeks, passivity is not a virtue in your pursuit of God. Right. Verse 1, he renounces pride. David says, I am not these things. In verse 2, which is always true of repentance and following Jesus, he chooses something better. He says, I am not these things, and I am these things. I will be marked by Amen. these things. Amen. He chooses composure. And notice that there's no middle ground. You're calm or you're frantic. Right. You're composed or you're anxious. Uh, you're a noisy child or you're a weaned child. And David makes it clear that the path to composure and quietness of soul must come through the process of weaning. Uh, another way to put it, you can't think and will yourself into this level of contentment. Uh, and weaning simply means that you and I no longer fret for what we once found indispensable. Now, here's some things that, if I'm not careful, I can find indispensable. Uh, honor, respect, comfort, control, recognition, a seat at the table, uh, for my name to be known and be praised in whatever way that looks like, uh, to be great and successful in the world's eyes. And yet those are the needs of a noisy soul. Yeah. But all these things David has to do. The posture of David's heart is that of Psalm 84, like we looked at a few weeks ago. Now he was content to be a doorkeeper in the house of his God. 84.10, for a day in your courts are better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Or as Eugene Peterson uh, paraphrases it, he says... One day spent in your house, this beautiful place of worship, beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. He says, I'd rather scrub floors in the house of my God than be honored as a guest in the palace of sin. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how familiar you, familiar you are with the story of David. Um, he was not scrubbing floors. <laughs> No. Uh, David was a kingdom builder. He was an achiever. He did great things. Jesus Christ, the man who perfectly models the composure of Psalm 131, did great things. He was a kingdom builder. 
Now, what I don't want you to do is uh, read this psalm or hear my words and create some sort of false dichotomy between quiet contentment and doing great things for God. Uh, David and Jesus model for us that these things can go hand in hand. I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named uh, George Mallory. Uh, George Mallory is the famous mountaineer, uh, I guess would be the term, mountain climber, uh, who died attempting to reach the peak uh, of Everest back when that was an uh, impressive feat. Uh, you may not know his name, but you've probably heard uh, his famous line that he said in an interview when someone asked him, uh, why is it that you want to climb Everest? Anybody know what he said? Because it is there. Because it is there. Uh, I love that. It's the most American possible response. <laughs> but he says, because it is there. Uh, but the thing about George and the part of the story that you don't hear uh, is that his dream really took a toll on his family. Uh, George's son, John, was just three years old when, it, uh, when his father died trying to climb Everest. Uh, in the introduction to a book called The Last Climb, not to be confused with uh, a Miley Cyrus song. His song, John, uh, wrote a piece, and he talks about uh, both his pride and his, uh, you know, great, the legacy that his father left. He talks about his pride uh, and also his sadness. And John writes this, I would so much rather have known my father than to have grown up in the shadow. <coughs> He says, I would so much rather have known my father than to have grown up in the shadow of a legend, a hero, as some people perceive him to be. Uh, George Mallory climbed Everest because it was there. Uh, but the thing that you and I skip over is that uh, his son John was also there, uh, and his wife Ruth was there too. Uh, it reminds me of the lyrics um, sung by... Uh, been record called What Makes a Man, uh, and in the song he just keeps asking questions about what it means to be a good man, uh, and in one line he asks, uh, he asks about what will his kids say about him one day, and he says, the line goes like this, will they think, will they think I was famous, or will they just think that I was never home? Yeah. And I say all that to say this, uh, the Lord is not opposed to you doing great things. But to be a believer is to redefine what a great thing is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe the Lord not only wants, but commands great things from every person in this room. And yet here's, here's what I want us to hear. I'm convinced that the greatest things you will do in this life will go unnoticed by the world. Right. Uh, the greatest things that we will do in this life will be unknown to the world and cherished by God. Yeah. Uh, and I think that starts when we recognize that greatness and obscurity are not at odds with each other. Uh, listen to this quote by uh, Pastor Zach S. Wine. He says this, I've been asking myself these painful questions. If I am bored with ordinary people in ordinary places, then am I not bored with what God delights in? If I think local limits of body and place are too small a thing for someone as gifted as I am, then don't I want to escape what God himself gladly inhabits? If I stare at a face, a flower, or a child, or a congregation, and say, but God, not this, I want to do something great for you, am I not profoundly misunderstanding what God says a great thing is? Right. Yeah. Uh, this is the composure that David has learned David understands what it means to be great in the eyes of God. Amen. Yeah. Uh, for David, that did look like being a king. It looked like being the king of Israel. Uh, but for most of us in this room, that's going to look like being mom uh, and being dad and being faithful at work and being faithful at school and at home and in your marriage and loving others well. Or as Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says, He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord ask of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Uh, that's the posture of someone who has renounced pride and chosen composure. And then finally, as we close, 
Uh, point number three, he invites us in. Amen. Verse three, O Israel, O chosen people, O treasured possession, O beloved, O sons and daughters, O Liberty Baptist Church, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Uh, the Bible continually encourages and commands us and draws us to uh, hope in the Lord, uh, to hope in God. Uh, and one of the primary reasons we are called to hope in God is to remind us that we are not Him, yeah. uh, that we are not God. Uh, and yet, like I mentioned earlier, the desire to be like God is very much alive and well in all of us. Uh, the problem with our desire to be like God is uh, that we don't want the things that he has for us. Uh, we should seek to be like God, and he calls us to be like him insofar as he is loving and kind and merciful and gentle and meek and forgiving. He says, be like me in these things. But so often we pursue the things that can only be true of God. Uh, we would rather be sovereign and self-sufficient and omniscient, knowing all things, or omnipotent, having all power. Uh, we want to be in all places at all times and know all things. So we get on social media. Uh, but the inward noise uh, of those cravings, of craving things too great and too marvelous for us, is inconsistent with the posture of Psalm 131, and it's inconsistent with the posture of Jesus Christ. Uh, so the question is, how do we dismiss all the angst and all the anxiety that is found in an sinfully, a sinfully ambitious soul? How do we reach the calm and quiet composure that we read about? Again, David Paulson is helpful here. He says this, we need a clear picture of what Psalm 131 is not. It does not portray blissful, unruffled detachment, a meditative state of higher consciousness. In other words, it's not Matthew McConaughey in every movie that he's in, that everything's just all right, and he's mostly high. That's not what Psalm 131 is about. He said it's not stoic indifference or becoming philosophical about life. It's not about having an easygoing personality or having low expectations so that you're easy to please. It's not retreat from the troubles of life and the commotion of other people. It's not retirement to a life of ease and wealth, the quiet of having nothing to do and no worries. It's not the pleasant fatigue that follows a hard day's work or a hard workout. It's, it's not the quieting of inner noise that a glass of wine or a daily dose of Prozac produces. After all, Jesus and David were both kingdom builders in real time, in real life. They expected and they achieved huge things in the midst, and that's important, in the midst of commotion and trouble. They experienced pressure, joy, heartache, outrage, affection, and courage. So Psalm 131's inner quiet comes in the midst of actions, relationships, and problems. So we do need to rightly understand what Psalm 131 does describe. This composure is learned, and it is learned in relationship. Uh, what he's trying to say is that inward calm and, and contentment of the soul is not achieved by this head in the clouds, ethereal, carefree, absent-mindedness, that everything's okay regardless of what's going on around you. But rather, it's learned in relationship. It's learned by walking humbly with your God. Yes, amen. Now, here's how I would like to close this out. Uh, I'm going to read Psalm 131 again. Uh, but before that, I'm going to read, uh, I forget who wrote this, but uh, it's called the Anti-Psalm 131. Uh, and as I read, I want us to do some uh, soul assessment. Between you and the Lord, as I read these two, which one of these psalms more accurately describes you. This is the anti-psalm. Self, my heart is proud and my eyes are haughty. I chase after things too great and too difficult for me. So of course I'm noisy and restless inside. It comes naturally like a hungry infant fussing on his mother's lap. Like a hungry infant, I'm restless with my demands and my worries. I scatter my hopes onto anything and everybody all the time. As opposed to Psalm 131, Oh Lord, 
My heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Luke, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. The composure of Psalm 131 is learned. Uh, it's learned in humility. Uh, it's learned in relationship with your God through his son Jesus. Uh, and I would add this, it's impossible without Jesus. Right. Right. Uh, I'll leave you with this and then I'll pray. Uh, one of my pastors in Texas used to say this over <coughs> our small group of wide-eyed, begging to get our name known interns. He would say this, you all are unbelievably ordinary. <laughs> you are unbelievably ordinary. Uh, you are imperfect. Yeah. Amen. And the risen Jesus dearly loves you. Amen. And believing that is the first step uh, to Psalm 131 being true of us. Yeah. Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, God, I thank you that your word continually flies in the face of my sinfulness and my pride and uh, all the incorrect things I think about myself and you and others. Uh, God, I thank you that your word slowly but surely molds us into who we should be. God, I pray that each of us in this room would leave uh, walking in those steps this morning just a little more humble than we were when we walked in, a little more reliant upon you, a little more dependent, uh, and just a little more lovers of Jesus. God, we love you. Uh, God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his sacrifice. Uh, we thank you that if it weren't for the cross, it does, if it weren't for the cross, it does not matter if we're composed and calm and content. God, we thank you that uh, you have redeemed our life from the pit. And because of that, Psalm 131 means something. God, meet us here in this space. Meet us uh, as we enter into a new year. I pray that uh, we would not weigh ourselves down with uh, resolutions that are essentially ways for us to occupy ourselves with many things too great and too marvelous for us. Uh, but we would recognize that in 2024, we are ordinary. Uh, we are imperfect. We will fail you. Uh, and yet we are dearly loved. Uh, God, grow us in the knowledge of that, in the knowledge of your son, Jesus. And for anyone who does not have a saving relationship with Jesus, Lord, let today be the day. God, I pray that they would not enter into the new year, uh, not a part of this family. Uh, and Lord, let them find any Christian in this place so we can show them. Uh, what it means to be a believer and a follower of your son, Jesus. And it's in his holy and beautiful name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Now please stand. Page 187, as your hymnal, or as just as I $655 uh, 
uh, for the Lottie Moon offering. So that is yeah. something yeah. to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, another thing is I just want to thank Corey and Sheila and our choir for the last four or five weeks or so of uh, more than they normally do. And I think our music during this Christmas season has been uh, good, yes, but more so than that, worshipful mm -hmm. and genuine. So if we could just give them a hand. The choir did all right, too. <laughs> uh, but a couple of quick announcements. Number one, Happy New Year. Uh, there is no prayer service tonight. We will pick that back up uh, in 2024. Uh, we will have the Tuesday morning prayer meeting uh, in the Glass Hall at 930. Uh, and this Wednesday, very important business meeting. Please be uh, at business meeting this Wednesday night at 6.30. Uh, and just to remind you one more time of our schedule change. Uh, this Wednesday will be business meeting, and then moving on after that, Wednesday nights will be prayer service, formerly on Sunday nights. We're moving that to Wednesday nights. Sunday nights will be our Acts Bible study. Uh, we wanted to do that because we needed more time uh, for our Acts Bible study for discussion, so we're flip-flopping those. So in the new year, just remember Acts on Sunday, uh, prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Amen. We are going back to how Baptist churches have always done it. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I have nothing else for us, and we will. Uh, no, Terry Mack has an announcement, and then we will sing. Yeah, I will begin working on the individual contribution statements this week for 2023. Um, a unique thing that's happening because today is the last day. The contributions that are given today will go on your financial statement for 2023. However, on the church's financial statement for December, they will not be included because they won't be deposited until after the first of the year. So they won't show up in the December financial statement for the church. They'll show up on the January financial statement for the church. Just wanted to let everybody know. I'm required by the IRS to have all of those individual contribution statements out before the end of the month. Um, I surely uh, expect to have them out well before the end of the month. Thank you. Amen. Yes. Thank you. We thank Terry McAnally for his work. With our <laughs> if he was not here, uh, we would all be in a lot of tax trouble if I, was, <laughs> if I had any, any hand on any of that. But uh, thank you for joining us, uh, and we will see you Wednesday night. So let's sing and be dismissed. Thank you.